Welcome to the Three Old Goalies Podcast. This special episode, Season 2, Episode 9, was recorded at the United Soccer Coaches Convention. It was a live recording. There were things that were happening in the room. So we've done some editing. Hope you enjoy the show. Be sure to have your earmuffs on the ready and enjoy this special episode with former U.S. Soccer Secretary General Hank Steinbrecher. Welcome to the Three Old Goalies podcast. I am Ryan Sparks. With me today, already on the screen if you're watching, um, John Boa, Greg Deutsch, and our special guest, Hank Steinbrecher. EV is here. You can't see him. He's here. He's right down below Greg's left hand. Like, <laughs> he's actually on the road, so we're traveling. So you can kind of hear him. Hopefully, we'll all be able to hear him throughout the the course of the show today. Um, we are actually recording this. They are at the United Soccer Coaches Convention. So we're trying to get all of this done in a very, very crazy time for everybody. And we appreciate you guys um, taking the time out at the convention, Greg and Hank. That I know it's a, a wild weekend and um, appreciate you taking the time today to, to chat with us. So, so what do you want to say, EV, about introducing Hank? So go ahead. You got the mic. Hello? You, yeah, you got the mic. You're introducing Hank. Oh, okay. Well, my greetings to everybody. Uh, it was obviously great to see everybody at the Soji Show. And uh, I'm going to ask my question here pretty quick because I'm going through the mountains and I don't think I've got really good reception and I'm scared that I'm going to drop off. And then, Bone, you can ask her, or Bones, you can ask anytime you want to. But uh, And I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, uh, having played for Hank. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, my question to Hank is, you know, uh, I think generally everybody in U.S. soccer or in the soccer world would consider the uh, Reina versus Berhalter, uh, I'll call it a fiasco. Um, and, you know, um, my question for later on is, uh, uh, you know, how this would have been handled if Hank was general secretary. All right. So we will get to that. Hank will answer that in a little bit. Do you, and do- I'll... And as they say on Sports Talk Radio, I'll, I'll hang up and listen. <laughs> All right. Do, do you want to do you want to introduce Hank? Give some Laurel, you know, some some things that you want to say before we get into this, EV. Well, yeah. What I would say before we get into this is uh, we were all privileged last night to attend Hank's induction into the United Soccer Coaches Hall of Fame. Uh, he gave, as Hank often does a very uh, meaningful and uh, rousing speech. Uh, I think both uh, Bone and myself, who played for Hank, were ready to, you know, at the end of the speech, we were ready to go play. And um, uh, But it was obviously great to see everybody. It was great to see Hank honored. Um, I've said many times, and I will continue to say it, um, regardless of what everybody else says, I think the man has done more for, for soccer in the United States than any other single entity, and uh, we're we're privileged and and uh, blessed and proud to uh, be in a small way associated with him. All right, thank you for uh, that little uh, those little thoughts there. And you know um, what I want to say, Ev, is um, you know that induction last night. Um, this is not his first Hall of Fame, right, Ev? Correct. Yeah, so let me just read some of this stuff um, because it, it, it's pretty mind-blowing. Um, as, as we mentioned, he was inducted last night into the United um, Coaches, the United Soccer Coaches Hall of Fame. Um, but here's some of the other Hall of Fames in case you guys don't know this. He's also a member of the New England Soccer Hall of Fame, the Eastern New York Soccer Hall of Fame, the North Carolina Soccer Hall of Fame, the West Virginia Soccer Association Hall of Fame and the NAIA Hall of Fame. Um, and he was recognized by the United Soccer Coaches with the Bill Jeffrey Long-Term Service Award in 1990 and the Honor Award in 2005. So congratulations, Hank. And thank again, you. thank you for taking the time to be on the YouTube um, episode with us. And in case you uh, listeners don't know, we have uh, on, uh, and Ryan can get into this and I'm sure he'll post it, we have done uh, six hours worth of interviews with Hank. They're into three episodes, so you can catch that on Spotify, Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, 
they're definitely well worth it. Some very, very funny stories. My suggestion is definitely start with episode one of Hank, then two, then three. Um, some hilarious stories. Uh, wouldn't you agree, V? Yep, we might have lost them there. We might have lost them again. Yep, okay, all good. That's what happens when you're, you're traveling on the road. Yeah, especially in the mountains, especially in yep. the mountains. So, Hank, let's first talk about the award last night. You know, um, a lot of people there you knew, um, just several hundred people. Um, again, congratulations on the award. What does award mean, you know, considering all the other accolades that, you know, I just went through? Um, well, first, it's always good to be back with you and, yes, and Aaron, okay. obviously. Uh, always. Thank you. Uh, this award for me was a very special one uh, because it, this organization launched my career. And uh, I used to sneak in when I was in college because I knew <laughs> I wanted to coach. Uh, my coach would bring me up and I'd sneak in so I didn't have to pay any fees because I was dead broke as a student. Uh, I want to hop in right there because that's important. There is a foundation that was set up that you were one of the first people to give a donation to in order uh, to help people be part one, of the organization. Uh, one of the first five. Yes. Yeah. So people need to know that because I know a lot of coaches out there are not aware that the scholarship exists for the United Soccer Coaches uh, yeah, Foundation. It, 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 this, but the, it was the my, NSCAA at the time, right? The scholarship with my name uh, is focused on allowing people who don't have any money who want to coach to be able to come to the convention and learn, which, which is what I did. I was a beneficiary of that. And I wanted to make sure that other people had that opportunity. So it's geared toward that young coaches who want to continue in the, their careers and can't afford to come and pay registration fees and flights and all of that. That money is set aside in a scholarship for, for those people. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I really wanted to make sure that people knew that that was the thing that existed. So I started coming in uh, 69, that's uh, so long ago, you'd think, uh, at the Commodore Hotel uh, in New York City. And I remember the first convention I, I went to, they had one booth of uh, uh, merchandise. It was Max Dawson Soccer Sports Supply on First Avenue yeah. in New York City. Great shoes. A great, <laughs> actually, actually, great shoes. They made a great bag as well, and yep. travel bag. Yep. Uh, and I knew Max because I'm a city boy. I was a city boy. And so I knew Max as well, and I knew his son Herman really well. Mm -hmm. But they were the only ones there. And now you come today, and oh my gosh, the, the, the whole arena is full of people showing their merchandise. It's, it's quite a remarkable growth. Yeah, and John Bo, you've been to these conventions and you know the celebrity status that Hank uh, attracts. And it was the same last night, by the way. So, uh, you know, you think you can walk 10 yards and you can, but it takes you like an hour. You know, if you remember those days, John. It however, was however, however, this is a true story. And it might have been in St. Louis or Cincinnati, but I remember walking up to him in like 97 or 96 or something and saying, Mr. Steinbrecher, I just want to introduce myself. I'm one of Eric Vauder's goalkeepers. And he turned around and shook my hand. John, it's so nice to meet you. Thanks for saying hello. <laughs> and then continued with, you know, 48,000 people following him, asking him why their son wasn't playing up front. <laughs> but yeah, but I uh, always had time for, for a member of the family. Yeah. True story. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I told Ryan I would mention this. So obviously I got the, you know, the tradition of the, the hat keep going, you know, wearing that, even though I've worn it before. But a little ode to Hank. I don't know if you can zoom in us on Ryan. So it's uh, a Peter Max tie from uh, 1994, okay, uh, when Peter Max did the poster and a little dedication to our friend Hank because of it. So no college stuff tonight or this morning. So just straightforward. So as we go on. So Hank, do you want to add anything else to, you know, the award last night? Uh, very, to me, it was very special. And uh, uh, as I said, this organization launched my career. Uh, I think that I was one of the very few people that made a jump from 
the coaches association into the management of the federation. Uh, so I was very happy to be uh, in, involved with both national organizations in this country. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and John, you know, Evie mentioned, you know, um, and, and I agree that Hank's been one of the most influential and instrumental people in uh, U.S. soccer. And, you know, and I was very careful on how I worded it because Hank is so humble and gracious um, on when we talk about this, because he's always talking about there was other people involved and partners involved. So um, do you want to add anything to that, Hank? Yeah, you know, I've, people have said many, many really, really nice things. But uh, the period of time that I was with U.S. soccer was a period of time of incredible growth. And, and as I said last night, uh, you know, we hosted the 94 Men's World Cup, the 99 Women's World Cup, which changed the entire sport culture picture in the world, uh, launched it professionally, uh, the Atlanta Olympics. Uh, so a lot of things were done in that decade. Uh, but as I said last night, truly, truly in my heart, uh, I, I don't take credit for any of that, Bones. Uh, I was in the middle of all of it, and I saw it all. I was witness to everything that went on, <clears throat> both the positive and the negative. But I can tell you, having been across this country, every state, almost every little town in every state, uh, visiting soccer people, that there's this, this great mosaic of soccer in our country. Mm -hmm. And only when you get to the 30,000 foot level and you look down, you can see this beautiful, beautiful mosaic of all, all colors and all, all types of people, uh, all pulling together to grow the game in, in the country. Uh, millions of people were the, the ones who were responsible. Soccer Americans are responsible for the success. Mm -hmm. uh, I simply sat on top of the organization. Uh, but I'm, I'm wise enough to know that it wasn't my efforts, that it was the efforts of that beautiful Mandela uh, that I see as the soccer in this country. Wow. Sat on top. Did you hear that, John? Sat on top of it. Uh, I, I say that's just leadership, right, oh, yeah. John? Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's exactly our point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. 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 Go ahead, John. No, no, I was just going to say again, you know, one of my favorite things about leadership is I've always, always tell, tell this to people. The first thing they teach you at West Point, observable behavior. And we, we have lacked that in spades for the past 28 and a half years ish. So that, I just want to get that out there again uh, about what we've missed since Hank has not been on top of that pyramid. <laughs> Okay, well said. Ryan, do you want to add anything on that? Thank I want to I want to ask a question here cuz you know me, I like to ask questions for people that maybe won't ask the question that is hard to ask, but for me, one of the questions I want to want to know is who doesn't get enough credit for the growth of US soccer over the course of the time? Yeah, who, it's a very easy, very very easy thing for me to answer. The name is Alan Rothenberg. Alan Rothenberg, yeah. He, if it were not for him, uh, what you're seeing today would not be possible. Hmm. He was the commissioner of soccer in the 84 Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell everyone here that it, success of soccer in the United States was not built on 94. It was built in 84. Mm -hmm. uh, the Olympic Games that we hosted because FIFA saw for the first time that this was a great potential market. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those of us who were involved with that uh, were really juiced because of it. But Alan Rothenberg sat on top of that. He was the commissioner of soccer for the Olympic Organizing Committee. Uh, he and Sunil. Uh, Sunil is every aspect of the game Sunil has been involved in. I don't believe that they get en enough credit for it. Hmm. All right. And, and I'll, I'll also add Dan Flynn. 20 years that he sat in that chair, and I know how difficult that chair is to sit in, uh, 20 years, and he was a man of, in, of incredible honor and integrity. So I, I've mentioned those people.
Any other awesome. question you want to add right now, Ryan? No, I just want to hear some more stories. All right, fair enough. <laughs> All right, let's jump into that. Good segue into that. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hank got to meet Pele a few times, um, and he's got some wonderful stories that he wants to share with us. So, um, you know, first, Hank, um, tell us, you know, what your reaction to his death was and what did he mean to you and what do you think he means to the world of uh, the sport of soccer? I was uh, pleasantly surprised at the depth of my feeling when I learned of his passing. I mean, we expected it. He's been sick for quite some time, right? Yeah. But the, the effect it had on me was uh, pretty strong. Okay. Uh, I've met him, as you know, many times. And each time I left thinking, I've been in the shadow of a giant, even though he's like five foot four or five mm -hmm. foot six or whatever. I was in the shadow of, of a giant. Uh, one of the most genuinely, genuinely kind. And I have no idea what that is. The beginning of Madam Butterfly. <laughs> Actually, it's the phone of a gentleman who was a high school teammate of mine. Wow. Uh, back in New York. Uh, and it was his phone going off. So, so. All good. No alarms here. No alarms here. All good. So, so back, back, back to, to Pele. Back to Pele. Uh, the very first time I met him, uh, I was a player. I was a, a youth player, and we played a preliminary game to Santos playing at Randall's Island. I think they played maybe Verna Brema, but I can't, I can't be sure. It was so long ago. But uh, uh, we played, the youth team played the preliminary, preliminary match to Santos, and he came by and shook everybody's hand. Literally, the only human being I've ever met where my heart beat faster uh, than when I, when I first met him. So juxtapose that to now it's the 94 World Cup. And FIFA and, Pe and Pele are having a big battle uh, because Pele called Havalange's son-in-law to share a crook. <laughs> And Havelange, you know, family disputes in soccer can go run real deep. So Havelange um, made Pele persona non grata in FIFA. And uh, we wanted to use Pele as a marketing board, you know, marketing tool for the World Cup here. He was a hero in the United States. Uh, so Alan Rothenberg and I met privately with, with Dr. Havelange. Uh, before the draw in Las Vegas, and uh, we we implored him, please, you know, lift this ban on Pele. Uh, the Americans love Pele, and if he can come out in support of our efforts, it, it will sell a lot of tickets. And Havelange looked at us both, and he had these deep, crystal clear eyes, blue crystal clear eyes, and. He, penetrating eyes. And he said, the next time you mention that person's name in my presence, Oof. this World Cup will be held in Germany. Oof. And you know what? He meant it. Oof. He meant it. And you knew he meant it. So Pele was out. Wow. But nonetheless, we used him anyway. So, <laughs> so we were at the Plaza Hotel in New York for a pre-World Cup cities uh, seminar. So these are the cities that are bidding to host the World Cup. And the person representing Dallas leading that delegation was Tom Landry, oh. the very famous American football coach. Wow. With his, his very recognizable hat. Of the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas Cowboys, excuse me. Uh, and uh, Alan... Uh, and my, I, I and Pele and Landry were walking across. If you've been familiar with the Plaza Hotel, it's right across from Central Park. Mm -hmm. And we were walking across the street. 
And uh, all of a sudden, a taxi cab pulls up, pulls up, screeches on his brakes, flings open the cab door, runs over to Pele to, get, to hug him and pat him on the back and get an, auto, get an autograph. Within five minutes, there had to be 50 cabs that had stopped. And now the, now the crowd is building and building and building and building. And the police had to come and scoot everybody away and give, give tickets to the cabbies. And Tom Landry's standing over there, and no one's paying one bit of attention. <laughs> in New York? Yeah. In New York City. That's Not crazy. one bit of attention. And you Because he didn't have the, anything to do with the Giants or the Jets. Yeah, you could just see <laughs> in Landry's face this quizzical look of, what the hell is going on here? Uh, so Pele had this in, incredible, incredible magnetism. But again, I'll say he was the most genuinely never ever out of character. Uh, and it wasn't, you could see it wasn't an act. He was just a kind, sweet, gentle giant. Is he the greatest player that you ever saw play in person? Without a doubt. You know, this stuff about the goat? There you go. Here, here, here's my response to that. When anyone scores 1,248 goals, when they win three World Cups by the age of 29 and 20 national championships, I'll call them Pele yeah. because that's what he did. Yeah. It, there's just no comparison. No comparison. Yep. Yeah. John, do you want to add to any of that? Well, I was just going to say that the, the three World Cup thing, I mean, and if there would have been any semblance of refereeing in 66, he could have oh, won four it he was absolutely brutalized. Brutalized. And the, Port the Portuguese killed him. Killed him. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't remember the last, what we said last time, if it was Portugal or Argentina. And I, yeah, it, it was, it was really ugly. And I'd forgotten too, which we talked about that, you know, no yellows, no reds then. Yeah. And, no, it was, yeah. I mean, I loved playing at that time because I was, <laughs> a butcher. you know, my nickname was Der Metzko. German means the butcher. And uh, I loved playing back then. Yeah, he and what is he shall not pass? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask you: What do you remember about the you know his last World Cup, nineteen seventy? Nineteen seventy World Cup. Yeah. What what comes to mind? You know, obviously, you know the Italian, you know Italy. Well, so if I, but you know quickly but what, close yeah. quickly close my eyes, I see Pele take the ball off chest, put it down, and pass it to Carlos Alberto. Alberto at full gallop, and the pace of that ball, with a shot in scoring the goal. How how much more beautiful can you get with the outside of his foot? Out simply, simply genius. Genius. It's a simple game, but boy, it's it's hard to be simple. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. Wow. Any more stories you'd like to well, to share with us that you want to? I have one funny story. Okay. I'll share. I actually I have many, but yeah, right. this is a funny one. Uh, so I had. Given my position at U.S. Soccer, I had met Billy a number of times. And my first FIFA Congress, which, gentlemen, is a whole other story, right? FIFA. And my first FIFA con Congress was in Zurich at the, the Sport, Sport Halle. And uh, a couple of thousand people, delegates from every country in the world. And Pele is there. I walk in the front door and Pele looks at me, he comes over, and he gives me a hug. He embraces me. And he says, boss, how are you? <laughs> Wait a minute. This is the guy whose my heart has beat faster than when I first saw him. Wow. And he, he says, boss, how are you? So I stopped him. We were chatting for a second. I said, Pele, I've got a story to tell you. And he said, what's that? I said, well, there was this man in Brazil, and he died. And Pele, <laughs> he's such a kind guy. You know, he made this face oh, a painful expression on his face. Hey, Pele, every man in Brazil will die. As he found out, every man will die. Mm. But this man was a very good man. So he went up to heaven and he met St. Peter at the pearly gate. And St. Peter asked him, what would you like to do? What would you like to be? And he, he said, what do you mean? He said, well, this is heaven. You can be anybody you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. It's heaven. And the man said, ah, to play for the Canary, to play in Maracanã, to play for the Brazilian national team. 
It's the highest honor that any man can achieve. All of a sudden, poof, the guy's in the middle of Maracana Stadium. 180,000 people are screaming his name. But the man's in tears. So St. Peter goes to him and says, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? Well, you should be happy. And he looks over his points and he says, oh, number 10, I, I did not know Pele died. St. Peter says, no, 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 that's Jesus. He just wants to be Pele. <laughs> and you call me boss. All right, I got it straight. <laughs> and I think that, that story kind of broke some ice with the, with the two of us. <laughs> so good. <laughs> just when you think you've heard all the stories from Hank. Then there was a time <laughs> that uh, we had a private dinner in New York. Alan Rothenberg and uh, Pele, Seth Abraham, who was the president of HBO Sport at the time, and myself at some nice, I don't even remember the name of the restaurant, some nice restaurant in Manhattan. And uh, Seth Abraham at HBO Sport, they were into boxing at that time. Yeah. Right? Right. HBO Sports and boxing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're at the dinner, and Seth says to, uh, to Pele, so champ, tell me. And I said, whoa, whoa, he, that's a boxing term, champ. He's, he's the king. <laughs> so champ, tell me, what were your most memorable moments in sport? And he said, well, I have two, actually, that, are, that stay with me. One is that because my team, Santos, were playing a game in, in Africa, and when our plane landed in the country, there was a war going on. And when the plane landed, they had a ceasefire. They stopped the bullets. Mm -hmm. And then we played the game. As we left, as soon as the plane left, they began to fight again. The war began again. It was a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't because Santos's plane was there. It was because Pele's plane was there. Yep. And it was the Biafran War in Nigeria. Oof. And they had a ceasefire because of the presence of this man. Uh, second was that they were playing a game in Bogota, Colombia. And before halftime, there was a fisticuff. There was a fight. And Pele went to break it up. But the referee thought that Pele was fighting, so he gave Pele a red card. <gasps> oh, my God. Pele's hardly ever red card. So he's down in the, in the locker room. He's about ready to get in the shower. And five policemen come down. And they, they say to him, Pele, uh, you have to come back on the field. No, 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 you don't understand. The referee, he gave, a, gave me a red card. I can't play anymore. And the policeman said, we just gave the referee a red card. <laughs> oh, man. There's a, as, as the resident historian, I've got to build on that uh, ceasefire story. There's a wonderful book by Simon Kuyper called Football Against the Enemy. And they, he spends a lot of time talking about that one incident and how certain things and certain people transcend sport. And other than Muhammad Ali, I can't think of another global icon. Michael Jordan. Jordan, yeah, I think we said that last week. That until we, until Mike, it was Muhammad Ali and and yeah, uh, those two, yeah, and our, and our friend Pele. So let's go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah. Ryan, do you want to add anything to the, the Pele? No, as you know, I wasn't old enough to watch him play live, so like I wasn't here yet. Um, all I've ever seen are highlights, right? And every highlight that I see, he was phenomenal. Um. So for me, it's just, it's hard when, when you talk about the GOAT, the reason I asked, is there any other better player? Because in my lifetime, you know, I didn't get to see him play. Have you guys ever seen his instructional video, uh, Master and His Methods? Yeah. yeah. That was like required, right, John? Exactly. You were younger. Video tape from, from, from Trace Video Sports. Yeah. And if you watch that, the things he was doing in that Dude. were – as profound uh, today as they were then. Absolutely. Just it was genius. Yeah. Well said. What can you say? We lost, we lost the giant. Yeah, we did. The king, no doubt. The king. The king. That's why Puma, right? Puma yeah. the king, right? The king. Okay. Yeah. Exactly right. Right. Still around. 
Yeah. Still around. The Three Old Goalies Podcast is brought to you by thesquad.com. That's squad with a W because everybody loves a W. Be sure to check out music from the Floodgate Operators. The Floodgate Operators open and close each and every episode of the Three Old Goalies with their track, Pieces on All right, the Floor. So, uh, you know, we, we've covered a few, you know, easy speaking topics. Now we're going to get into, you know, maybe a little controversy here. No comment. No comment. All right. Already? I haven't even asked the question yet. <laughs> So we heard EB, you know, we heard EB before he got caught in the mountains on, on the drive. Um, what, what do you, what were your initial thoughts when the story broke? You know, with the Burhall Arena fiasco, um, you know, that hit and and certainly moved very quickly. Um, you know, throughout the U.S., uh, I mean, people immediately were talking about it. Um, obviously, there needed to be verification. A lot of parties involved. What was your initial thoughts about this story breaking? Uh, initially was, I, I have a great deal of empathy uh, for the coach in this situation. Uh, family disputes are very, very difficult and they are profound and they, they run very, very deep. So I, I had uh, initially a sense of uh, remorse for empathy uh, for the coach. Uh, but you know, in the, the more global picture of soccer in America, and what does it mean? Uh, it appears to me that we can take a step forward and we take two steps backward. Yep. Almost, almost every time we have this advancement in the public eye, we seem to shoot ourselves in our own feet yep. uh, and uh, go backwards a bit. Um, it's been a very, very tough year for U.S. soccer to begin with, and uh, uh, this was particularly difficult. Now, if you're in sport and you're in the World Cup, uh, these things magnify themselves because it's a month-long tournament of attrition, hmm. and, and the white light of the media is on you all the time, so things get magnified. Right, right. Uh, and uh, it can easily, easily spin out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think that this, this past month, the whole nation was playing for a, praying for a football player number three of the Buffalo Bills. Pray for three. So we have that, and we have mom and dad acting badly because their son's not getting any playing time. Uh, what story captures the American spirit? Well, we shot ourselves in the foot again. Bingo. Uh, so, Hank, you know, you said you initially, you know, your comments were initially this, initially that. So now that you've had time to digest it, okay, maybe expand on some of the thoughts now. How do you handle it? That's, that's, the, that's the question. The leadership, right? The leader. How do you, ha how do you handle it? Uh, I would have hoped that um, someone at the Federation, uh, above Ernie Stewart's level, right, right, would have been able to intervene. Yes, and and say, wait a minute, we're talking about an incident that happened 31 years ago. There's no police report on it. They took it to their families. They took it to their to their coaches. Uh, they went through counseling. Uh, 25 years, four kids. Uh, does this really rise to the to the level where we have to have a full blown investigation? Right. Or is it just is it just one family being very angry because their son was not getting enough playing time? So, do you feel was it just a knee jerk reaction because of all the things this past year that U.S. Soccer has had to deal with? <sighs> This is a, a, a interesting topic because when you work at the Federation, you are the government. And Americans don't like government to begin with. <laughs> and what happens generally after a period of time, you get a bunker mentality. Because, Absolutely. Because everybody's throwing bombs at you. Right. You know, no, no matter how good you are, 
the bombs are coming across at you every oh, day. Yeah. And you become kind of shell shocked, kind of paranoid on the uh, you know, <laughs> kind of reaction. Uh, and that may have been the case here because you know the Federation has been under a great deal of pressure uh, throughout the year. Uh, but I had wished that uh, somebody at a higher level had intervened early. But then again, we didn't have a general secretary mm -hmm. at the time, right? Right. We just we're in this period of, of transition. Right. Uh, makes it even more difficult. Right. So, so John, what would you like to add to this? You know, I know you've got some questions that you want to ask. Well, he, he, he said the exact word that you never want to hear about a leader. They went into reactive mode. And if there would have been a solid plan, physical, mental, <laughs> John wouldn't ask, this is how we do things here. Then someone would have taken them into the room and say, okay, fellas, we are in the World Cup, okay? We know we have issues, but we got to put this down. And then, Claude, you and your wife, we can talk about this when we get back to Chicago. But right now, we have to beat Holland. But nobody's going to do that. If, you know, Ernie and, and my man McBride are sitting there talking to talking to Claude behind the manager's back. It, you, you can't. This isn't a democracy. Somebody's got to be in charge. My, my, my concern is that what message does it send when you don't do anything? When you do nothing. What message does that send yeah. across the board? Yeah. My concern now would be, uh, all right, I'm the general secretary. I have to go out and find a coach. All right, Grace contract's over. Do we renew it? Uh, what is my recommendation to the president who then brings that to the board for ratification? Uh, but l listen, generally speaking, the general secretary his recommendation is usually generally followed. Sure. Right. Well, right. Uh, Who else wants this what, job what at this point? At this end? Let's say we're going to go out and we want to get Martinez, who coached Belgium, a class act, a wonderful human being, a strong disciplinarian. He built the Belgian program. So he's out of work. Maybe we go and interview him. Well, if I'm him, Martinez right now, I'm sitting back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. You mean a mother of a parent of a player on the national team can get me fired yeah uh i don't think i want that job yeah it makes it really hard to to promote the position to somebody right like uh, the, who wants that, who wants to deal run, with that in the long run that's going to be a real difficulty that's going to be a difficult so then you have to say the, the operative the operative decision here on the coach is who can take us to the next level Who's the best American coach we have? And I could make you an argument that Bear Holter is the best American coach that we have available. Sure, right? sure. I can make that argument. Mm -hmm. But can he take us to the next level? We're playing at home, for God's sake. Yep. It's 2026. We don't want to shoot ourselves again in the foot. Uh, so who do we who do we get in? And it makes it it makes it the equation that much more difficult. Does an American coach want to take that job off, over? Does Peter Vermish want to uh, be apt to say, well, you know, he said something to me 30 years ago that I thought was mentally abusive, uh, and he emotionally uh, berated me. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to fire him. Well, no one's going to step up into that plate. Well said. John, do you want to add anything else to uh, some of those comments? No, no, I just, you know, it's, there's a real, um, there's going to be a void of a competitive edge here. Now I'm talking about between the line stuff here. I know that U.S. Soccer Federation doesn't want to talk about the product on the field, clearly, but it's going to be six years before we play a game in anger. I mean, we, we have, they have this gap, what, three and a half years for the World Cup, then we're going to have to like turn it up a notch. And we got guys coming in from Leeds and Werner Bremen and, in Barcelona, and we got to put them all together. I think the Bora type mentality, or I don't know Vermes that well at all. I don't know what he's like as a trainer. But again, in this country, we're like, who's going to coach? Who's going to coach? Just you're managing the the Bulls here. I mean, you're basically figuring out patterns and how to get your best player the football. 
And yeah, I don't know who is, who is soccer's Phil Jackson. Is that what you're asking right now? Yeah, just yeah, just keep, hire Phil Jackson. Hire Pat. Hire Pat Riley. But like, somebody's got to be in charge and say, look, this is our strength. This is our weakness. And you know, I was listening to Aronson, that wonderful kid from uh, Jersey, that's doing so well at Leeds yesterday. Wonderful player. Wonderful. Um, and his yeah. brother may be better. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Okay. And. You know, he was talking about growing up in New Jersey and playing in the basement on rainy days like we all did and making up games. And he, but he said, and our players are still so naive. He goes, well, you know, we just read into a red hot Holland and we could beat anybody on our day. I, I mean, I don't know what it would have taken for us to beat Holland, but I mean, not marking people is a problem. So um, again, I, I, I think we need someone to say, look, guys, yeah, I, you got a Nike contract. That's great. But this is your job. This is your role in this team. And to use EV's Herb Brooks thing, I need my type of players to build my team to win, to advance. Is that, you know, look at Ronaldo. Manchester United is a completely different team than they were nine months ago. Yeah, we were just watching that game before we recorded this. this I podcast mean, and, and, and they really, about other that. than adding Casemiro from Real Madrid, this is the same players. And yeah, they Casemiro just, played really well today. And they just came from behind to beat City, two to one, the best club team in the world over the last ten years. So anyway, I've talked enough. But again, there are because, so many people. So many people say, "Well, we don't have to qualify; we automatically qualify." Yep. This is a very big problem. Big it makes problem. it harder, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I want to. That's yeah, that was one of my questions that I have. That. Absolutely. You know, because you're you're right. There, there's you know, like you said, there's no meaningful games um, for the most part, right? We got nations and. Concaf, some stuff coming up, but it's like, okay, if we lose, so what? We're still there, right? So, what's the mentality in your belief on the path to get that myth out of everyone's head or the perception? You have to incentivize players to win, okay, and desensitize them to for losing, have a punishment for losing, okay, okay. Uh, for, so, for give me, us an me, example. Well, like, for me, know, it was yeah. it was. Uh, it was a fortunate thing for me that, that we didn't have to qualify in 94 uh, because our team really, you know, is part European and part here. So we made a decision that what we wanted to do is create a professional team. We have no league without a professional league. Uh, and so you had pros, but no league. So we played all the best competition in the world. Mm -hmm. We went out and even, even when you played, Bones, we tried to get the toughest competition possible all, all the time. Right. Our, our league play was not nearly as important as playing the top teams in the country and getting beat. Because right? that's where you learn your lessons. Yep. Uh, so, so we had the opportunity to do that. But now you have a league and you still don't have this pressurized environment. Uh, Concu qualifying CONCACAF is not an easy task. Everybody says, oh, El Salvador. Go down and play in yeah, you got to go there. That's and exactly you, right. you tell me how, how easy it is. Right. It's a cow pasture. I mean, Klingsman found out, didn't he? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So you think we should be scheduling the, the top 10 teams year in and year out in the next round? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. There, there's your answer, John. That is the only way, and I think we said it last week. You can't. You, you're not gonna. You got to go to Buenos Aires, and you got to go to London, and you got to go to Munich, and you got to go to Madrid, and you got to take it, and you got to so, get better, and you got to perform under pressure away, and that if, and you got to be strong enough to say, don't don't worry about the wins and losses. Now. That's it. Yeah. It's about getting That's better. It. I mean, how, how did wins and losses suit us when we got over to Qatar, for God's sake? Did well, we tell yep. my U10 girls team, you either win or you learn? Like, that's what I tell them. Yeah. Like, we go and we play teams that are one or two divisions higher than us. We've moved them up to try to help improve their game, right? This is what U.S. soccer, the men's national team, really needs to look at. We're ranked 13th in the world. We uh, should be sorry. playing – it's right, artificial. Right, but we should be playing all of those teams above us. No question. All of them. No, no question. But there's also opportunity in that, uh, from a marketing perspective. Uh, so you really have to 
get in and work that schedule because you can make a lot of money playing those games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and oh, by the way, we now have contracts with uh, television where it demands our, our playing X numbers of games against X numbers of level of competition. Right. Right. So I have a question from a listener to the podcast that might actually fit in this spot right here. So I'm going to throw this one in. Um, and you can, no comment is a fair, a fair answer to this. If you don't want to answer it, um, does MLS and bringing in a number of players from MLS actually hurt the U S men's national team when it comes to building the roster? And, and let, before he answers that, Ryan, let, let's, you know, cause you and I've talked about this, you know, share with our listeners and viewers, you know, currently where's MLS in the rank compared to EPL, La Liga, Bundesliga. All right, because I think some people will be a little shocked. I know I was when you and I discussed it. Um, so I don't want to. I don't want share the result. I'll let you take that topic. By what so, metric? So there's a. It's very very convoluted metric. Okay, <laughs> it's crazy. So there's like three different websites that basically have compiled all this information, like who are the best teams, who are the worst teams in each league. Where do the teams fall in with certain statistics? It's hard to really understand. Um, but according to these three different websites, they've compiled all this stuff. Um, they put it out. It's on globalfootballrankings.com. So if anybody wants to go out there and view it, they can they can check that out. I'm sure John's looking right now. Um, but it ranks Major League Soccer at 15th um, amongst the leagues in the world. Um, it says Philadelphia Union is the best team and it says DC United is the worst team in that that mix. Um, I find that hard to disagree with that top to bottom as far as roster goes. Yeah, um, fair enough. But but share but, some of the leagues that you know again that I mean that the Premier League's might, number one. I find very surprising. Yeah, I mean the Premier League's number one, which I don't know anybody that can really argue that against that. Um, the Bundesliga is number two, um, Spanish Premier Division is number three, Serie A is number four, uh, French Liga one wow. is number five. No, wow. this is where I have a this is where I have a problem. You, you get those leagues, France, some of the other leagues that are mentioned, two teams. You look at Argentina. Who are the two teams? They're two teams. River Plate and Boca play in that league. Yep. Right. All right. Okay. It's not top to bottom kind of competition that we have in in, right. in this country. So, some of this Brazil, how how many teams constantly play for the playoffs in Brazil? Yep. Two to three teams. Yep. Yeah, and Brazil's ranked eighth, just for reference. France, how many teams in France? Uh, I can be honest. I know like a couple. <laughs> right now, I, no, like I don't watch I don't watch the French league because I feel like PSG is just. The Bulls. So all, all, with all, like, all due fairness to these people who spent a lot of time crunching these numbers, it's bullshit. That's cool. I, it doesn't. That's... It doesn't matter. What matters is on the pitch and in playing. That's what matters. But, but Hank, I think you'll you'll be stunned. Continue on with some of these rankings, so Hank can sort of get the full picture here. Yeah, it's a, it's it does get very interesting. So the Dutch. Dutch league is six, Portuguese Liga seven, Brazil is eight, like I mentioned. Uh, Mexican Primera Division's nine. Here's the one that got Greg's attention. The Russian Premier Liga is ten. It's garbage. <laughs> <laughs> like Hank's not even reacting. He's like, yeah, Hank's not even reacting. But when I so and that's I that's rest, I, I rest my case. Right. No, no, no. I understand. But I, I continue to look at these things in, I don't want to say the average fan, but like there are fans of American soccer that are MLS fans, right? Or like like a lot of people give me a hard time because I don't know a lot of the leagues overseas as well because I watch a lot of USL soccer. I spend a lot of my time watching the USL um, because I like the competition in that league. Um, it's not necessarily like the top, two or three teams like and Lou city as much as I don't like them because they were a rival for FC Cincinnati for a long time. Like they consistently are competitive. Right. And, but there are other teams that have challenged them and it's fun to watch just the competition in the league. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So now, go, go back to the rankings, Ryan, on, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14. 11 13. is the English League Championship. Uh, Belgian Jupiter League is or is 12. Again, again, in Belgium, there's two teams. Again, yeah. Austria, yeah. one team. Yeah, yeah right. Australian, and then Turkish Super League is 14. You, you, oh, right. Did you say Australian or Austria? Austria. Uh, Austria. 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 Right? Throw another yeah. shrimp on the Barbie, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, All right, so, so you had some other. So, so now it's, that it's forget. good, it's good press, and it's good for the public because you're going to debate that. In my opinion, though, it's bullshit. Okay. All right. right. Next question, Ryan. All right. Um, all right. So everyone everyone I ever talked to and if if heard about that's talked about you, Hank, has always said how great of a leader you were and are. What's the one characteristic that you think the current leadership is lacking at the federation level that they really need to to fix in the short term? And this could decisiveness. Okay. Mm. He didn't hesitate on that one, did he? No, no. no. And I, I, I didn't expect him to. Decisive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a, I had a theory that I kind of developed when I was at U S soccer. And I, I observed a lot of people. I worked in corporate America. If you remember for seven years, watching some great, great, great leaders, uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about making a right decision. Hmm. You know, they'll turn it over in their head. They'll turn it over in their head. They'll take out a, a yellow sheet, a legal sheet, and they'll put the pluses and minuses, pluses and minuses. I think as a good leader, you have to get the overview, the gestalt image of what is going on and make a decision. And then the job is to make the decision the right decision. So I would tell our staff, I'll make the decision. It's your job to make my decision right. That's the job. That's going in my book. <laughs> I hope it goes in his book when he writes it, right? When he finishes it. How you important on that, Hank, by the way? Hank is writing a book uh, for all you out there. Um, it's a little it is a lot rough. harder than I ever anticipated. <laughs> you, got, you have one thought, and that brings up 10 other memories. Right, yeah. And... How do you condense that? And I know editors are the ones that do that, but uh, you live the life I've, the, the richness of the life I've been able to live. And uh, there's just an awful lot to put down. Yeah. Do you think uh, it might get done this year? Could be close. Could be close. Could All right. Be close. So he started in 2022, just so you guys know out close. there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I keep asking Hank, you know, what the uh, updates are. And he's always like, you know, I'm pecking away, I'm pecking away. So uh, hopefully this year uh, it does uh, take place. Yeah. I mean, uh, we'll plug Tommy Mulroy. Uh He's, I don't know if you know, he's coming out with a book. Oh, I know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tom. Oh, that's what, yeah. Tom Mulroy, John. Pretty, yeah. Pretty impressive. I'm I'm just, I, well, I'm, I'm glad that Hank's book is not out yet because I've got to finish my Harry and Megan book first. <laughs> and then, and after I broke with that down, <laughs> they already have a Netflix special. So just stop writing that book because nobody's going to read a book when they can watch it on Netflix, right? Oh, yeah. All right. Hunga, hunga. All right. Ryan, you know, I, all right. I appreciate the comments about thinking that I'm a, an adequate leader. So I, oh, okay. I appreciate the comment. All right. Next question from some of our viewers. Uh, All right. That you've gotten, and, you know. And by the way, Hank. So one of the questions I don't know if he's it's already come up, but it's been from a uh, former um, um, state uh, director, by the way. Director of coaching. Uh, no, uh, from the whole executive state. executive director. director. So okay. we we might want to you know touch base you know with that question if you have it ready for us. Yeah, I I do. Um, what can U.S. soccer do? to improve scouting around the country in order to help improve our national teams. Now, Hank, while you digest that, John, me, and EV, right, John, we've, we've been on this. I am so, so glad, awesome. Ryan, that you brought that up because last night I was watching a documentary about Nolan Ryan, speaking about pros, by the way. And so I went to the Houston Astros website 
The Houston Astros have 23 scouts. That's one club. How many does U.S. soccer have? I have no idea now how many they have. I don't think they have any. <laughs> no, they, they have scouts. They have scouts. Well, let, let me, my point let, is. Let me, let me go back. Okay. And let, let's talk. Scouting is a structural issue as well. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the Federation, for the longest periods of time, uh, had to be involved with player development, scouting, et cetera. We had no pro league. Right. Okay. Now the pro league is 28 years, and they have begun to turn the corner of the economic incentive of identifying players at young age, training them well, signing them to contracts, and reselling them. This is the business of sport, the right. business of soccer internationally. We, on the other hand, because we had no pro league, had to develop this artificial system to develop our players. Uh, the only way you really develop a player is through economic incentive. That's the only way. You, you can't do it arbitrarily uh, from a federation. Uh, it's too complex and too political. So how do we help grow the game in areas that the game's just not popular in our country? Either for econ economic reasons, uh, there's no pitch for them to play on in the in the neighborhood that they're in. Like, how do we really go into those areas and and try to improve the growth of the game and get the athletes that are that are in those areas interested in what we're doing? So, you, you in this regard, you can't have a simplistic answer, uh, <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> but do you, are you familiar with the name Rinus Michels? I am not. I am. I am very familiar. So Renus Mikkels was the, they called him the general. Yes. And he was the coach of the Dutch team in the, in the 74 World Cup that finished second to Germany. Yep. Uh, crystal, crystal clear mentality of football. So when I came on board with the Federation, I retained his services uh, to help structure our organization. Uh, and when he came in, it was not inexpensive, but when he came in, I said, uh, uh, Rinus, you have one job, you and your wife come over here. All I want you to do is travel around the United States, go to different areas, go to regions, go to this, go to that, and come back and tell me what you think we need to do to develop our football. Well, three months later, he comes back. And he says, well, the problem is you're a continent. You're not a country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought immediately, Jesus Christ, is this what I'm paying this guy money for? <laughs> and then I went home and I thought about it. And I said, you know what? He's, he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. he's Boa and I were talking about something very similar to that earlier because we were talking about the possibility of splitting MLS into two conferences to where like they don't play anybody in the other conference because of time zone issues, because of how hard it is to travel from LA to New but York. It's not just time, with that. It's not just time zone, it's climatic zone. Right. So the, the weather. Yeah. So, so the, the style of play in LA is very different than the style of play in Maine. Right. All right. Very different than the style of play in Miami to Chicago to Seattle to Dallas, all of these places have different styles of play predicated upon their geography yep. and the climatic conditions on how to play. So the difficulty here is how do you get all of those people, all of those players into the same mentality, uh, the same training? I refer to it as vertical integration. So. What our national team coach should do is set the stylistic approach to the game that best suits our players and then bring that to every single single state association across the country. And then you have to say, well, it's not just state associations that are running players. It's the NCAA. Uh, it's the colleges. Uh, so it's a really, really complex question. 
complex question. Do you think it's gotten better, Hank, as far as the scouting? You know, uh, you know I, uh, it, it has. I mean, where does the Aronson brothers come from? You know, look at the kids that are now playing. We, we, we say have rich talent. Well, we do have rich talent, but they're identified somehow. And the way they're identified now is your MLS scouting system goes out and says, sign this player for $150,000, <laughs> develop him and sell him for $15 million on the open right, market. Absolutely. And then the next time he's sold again, we get 5% of that as well. Right. So, uh, so that's the business part of it. And that's the economic incentive. So my opinion, the MLS, it, we're still only 28 years old. I mean, we've crossed over the hump. Uh, but that's the key to success, is developing a strong professional league. And I have to say, Don Garber has, is an unsung hero. He's still he's there. Done, he's done an unbelievable job with the MLS. And I knew Don from my days at Gatorade, because he worked at the NFL. And he was our liaison between Gatorade and the NFL. Hmm. Uh, so I knew him for a long time before this. He's done a marvelous, spectacular job. All right, Ryan, any more questions that the listeners have asked you to ask Hank? No? Ah, we can't hear you. Say that again. Okay, I've got some yeah. more. Yeah, here we go. All right, here we go. If, if there's a short list for the U.S. men's national team job, other than Greg Berhalter, Who's on your short list? Peter Vermey, Jesse Marsh, Curtin. Jesse Marsh, I think, probably is the lead. In, yeah. Yeah, because he's about to lose his. Uh, and I'd have a real keen eye on Sean Bell. Oh, wow. See, well, Greg, oh. see, Jim Curtin's not that far away from there, though. See, oh. I told you. <laughs> he did. He, 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 I, I saw him in the bar last night. So. Uh, yeah, no, he's by far one of my favorite. One of my favorite coaches right now. So, 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 Hank, let's talk a bit a little bit about Jesse Marsh. Obviously, he's with Leeds. A little bit difficult just to bolt from there. Uh, first, do you, do you think uh, uh, because of his position there that he wouldn't he would even want it? I don't know if very many coaches, given what's happened right now, uh, will want it. Okay, uh, and it may take a while for this to calm down before someone gets a, a sense of reality and, and uh, can put this behind us. Fair enough. Well, the, the door's door. not closed on this chapter yet. Do, do you think it's important that we do name someone in the next 30 to 60 days? No. No. Okay. Well, what about offering? I, I say that with a caveat. Oh, okay. I, I thought that the hiring of Bearhalter was unnecessarily delayed. Hmm. Because of political environment of the Federation. Fair yeah. enough. My, his brother. Uh, yes. It was, what, 18 months before we had a national team coach? Yes. And that's not good. Not at all. But they did say already that the assistants are going to run this next window of friendlies, right? So that's... Assistance, assistance to whom? Uh, the, <laughs> the current assistants on the World Cup yeah. team. And what, and what happens when a new coach comes in and says, I want my team in? Right. So, but that this window is only two games, and then they'll play again till March. So, I think that might be there. I I can't. I don't know how Burhalter can still be in the conversation if he's you know not getting any support from the federation and his players haven't said anything. What if the players well, have players said something? Have to said something. something. His players have said something. I have a, Zimmerman and McKinney came out and said he's yeah the, 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 the we support the yeah okay no. fair enough so so hang on hang on guys so Hank let's talk about you know there's some rumors that maybe they'll sign you know a Berhalter to a two year deal sort of like test not, the waters not a good idea and why not because you we're playing host to the World Cup and instantly and, 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 and two years is not enough time to do it okay there we go all right go ahead Brian. How important is the stability to, like, I feel like if you keep a coach for longer than four years, like, and this is one of those situations where if we keep him around for another four years, does that stability help the squad? 
or is it just being comfortable? Like, is it gonna... my, my position on whether you return retain a coach for two quadrenniums yeah. is that it's not a wise thing to do. And and the reason is the coach gets fat. And I'm not talking about putting on weight. I'm talking about being mentally fat because he then starts to surround himself with people who say yes all the time. There you go. Uh, and you have to have on any good team, you have to have some friction. Friction is growth. Uh, you, you have to have some tension uh, within a team. Uh, and if it's the same for eight years, people get too comfortable uh, in their positions and it, it lacks stress. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've talked about this before, Hank, you know, Bruce went through it second time he failed. Bob Bradley went through it. He failed. Jurgen Klinsman went through it. So obviously there is some historical, you know. Yeah. But on the other, on, on the other hand, you look at the, the champs from France. Rare though. That's right? the anomaly. It's rare, right. That, that's it's, the other extreme. Though, for right? my study, it's rare. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the rare. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, Ryan, back to you. Got the next one. Uh Oh, no, this is actually, this is beyond the, the U S men's national team stuff at this point. What tools are underrated for young coaches that we just don't spend enough time doing to make younger coaches better? Like what things are we missing? Man management. And what does that mean to give us an example? Geo Randall. Okay. <laughs> Go down this path again. How, okay. how many in, in the courses you see, whether it be from the United Soccer Coaches or U.S. Soccer, how much do you see about man management and leadership? Very little. Zero. Not much at all. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. That was a pretty simple answer. All right. Um. Let's see. I'm trying to find if there's any other... Because a lot of them, a lot of them, we've already talked about throughout the course of of the yeah. conversation. So, um, one that this is really interesting to me that somebody brought to my attention, and I, I do want to ask and just to hear your thoughts. The MLS season pass situation with Apple TV and putting the games behind a paywall. Um, I know that there's money on the business side. I I understand that. But is that good for the game, or is getting the game on more open airwaves better for the game as far as growth? What are well, your I wasn't involved in those negotiations, so I don't right. know the dollar sign. Two hundred fifty million dollars from Apple TV. Yeah. Uh, How much? Two hundred fifty million. Two hundred fifty million dollars for a ten-year deal. Oh, ten years. Okay. No, but it's two fifty a year. In my right, Ryan. No, uh, that I don't know for sure, okay. but I knew it was two fifty. It was two fifty. Yeah, two fifty total over uh, uh, yeah. a ten million deal. The axiomatic answer to that is: the more people that can watch the game, the better the game will become. Right. Okay. All right. So, so Hank, I want to take some time now to sort of hear some thoughts on wherever you want to go with this uh, on this episode. You know, what what do you maybe want to rant about or? Get well, I don't want to rant, us. but I've, I've been sitting here having this thought Okay, that uh, in the military, uh, are leaders born or are they made? In our military, which is probably the best military in the world, uh, there is an ascension to leadership. If a leader goes down in battle, Someone's standing up and taking his spot. So are they made or are they born? So clearly the answer to that is they're made. Right? Because they they step into the, sure. into the breach. Right. Now, how are they able to do that? And, and the answer to that to me seems to be that they have they are mission driven. Uh, they know what the mission is. There's clarity to what the end goal is. There's clarity to what everybody's role is. So when someone goes down in a battle, the next man can pick up the, the, the charge 
because he knows what the mission is. Right. And he knows how to execute that mission. Right. What's our mission now? What's our mission at U.S. soccer right now? Who's writing that mission? As I said last night, we had a moonshot. Yeah. Our, my generation of soccer Americans, we, we had a calling. And that calling was to develop the game in America. That was our calling. It wasn't a matter of money. It was a matter of believing in that and that, that mission. And we were able to put objectives to that mission and strategies to that mission. We had a moonshot, this new generation. What's their mission to Mars? Who's, who's, who's leading that mission? Who's writing the mission? Who's communicating the mission? So that if somebody goes down, somebody else can pick up the mantle and run and lead. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, I've never seen it articulated. During my tenure, I took a lesson from business. And we had a strategic planning session, 250 people in Chicago to map out the mission of soccer in America. And the mission was simple. By the year 2005, soccer in all its forms will be a preeminent sport characterized by excellence in international competition, spectator appeal, and gender equity. That was the mission. We had lots of detail behind that mission, detailed plans, uh, detailed objectives. And I can honestly sit here and say our mission to, mark, to the moon, put a man on the moon, bring him back alive, mission accomplished. Absolutely. Now, your generation, what's your mission in Mars? You know, what is that? Who's, again, who's leading that charge? Do you where, think it's a simple answer? Get? You know, obviously we're hosting the World Cup, do very, very well in it. Is, do you think it's that simple? No, it's, it, it's, ultimately it is. Win a World Cup. Ultimately that's it. Right. And everybody say, oh, America, winning the World Cup is such bullshit. It's right. just hyperbole or whatnot. Yeah. That's the mission. God darn it. That's the mission. Now, how do you get there? Uh, who's developing this? Yeah. Where, where is it? Where's the plan? Who's out saying across the country, not saying that I did a great job or not did a great job, do a great job, but who's out there with all of the people involved in the game, bringing us all together, all pulling the oars at the same time? Uh, who's overseeing that? I don't see it. Yeah, okay. John Bow, do you want to add anything to this? Not a thing. Got you thinking? No, I just it, it just it just pisses me off. Well, I'm sorry I pissed you off. <laughs> but I mean it's I mean he's right. I mean there's there's plenty of there's plenty of foundation and groundwork formed, let's say since 1950, since 1970, since 19 any benchmark you want, and we just have blown it. And it's uh it's it's selfish and myopic, and it is uh, horrifically it's a sin. What where we are right now in 2023 uh, in this country with with the sport. So and now you know the rest of the world is catching up with us with women's football. So you know, I, I just I, I don't see a lot of uh, I don't see a big pot of gold at the end of, rain, at the, end of the rainbow of quality or 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 mass interest in this sport in this country. Ryan, you want to add anything to that? I think it really boils down to, and I know it's weird for me being the, the middle-aged white guy to say this. I truly believe that diversity and inclusion is an important part of what we need to focus on. And that's why I was on that task force for us soccer. When I, when I participated in it, I think we we're just missing being inclusive like in trying to get as many people to love this game and in many as many levels as possible I Tell, think, talk to me about this inclusion <laughs> have you looked at the com composition of the men's national team 
Yeah, and that's and the men's national team. I, I get the 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 pieces as far as um like people of color on the team, and I under, I understand that. Um, I'm more interested in the communities that can't afford to play the like put the game together themselves. Then I then I agree with you. I'm really struggling with that piece. It's the socioeconomic okay. piece that I that's that an I'm, inhibitor. That's an inhibitor to our growth. Right. right. What's the plan to change that? Oh, I would I would hope that the more of the mini pitches that are going up that that MLS clubs and other clubs in the area are putting in neighborhoods would would help that. Um, I think getting those players that are on the U.S. men's national team that are people of color out into the communities and and playing with the kids in the communities and showing them the game and helping them understand the game a little bit better. Um, I mean, I've got people that are on the sideline that still don't know what offside is. They're at games every weekend. Like there's just like, it's an education piece as well. Um, I, I want every kid that wants to play this game to be able to play this game. And that's why I was a volunteer coach for 24 years. Um, I'm, I feel like we're missing something there and there are kids that, could be amazing soccer players that don't even get an opportunity to play. Yeah. All right. Back to you, Hank. Any other thoughts that you want to do before we uh, close out this episode? Things on your mind? I'm an American soccer player. I call our people, our country, uh, soccer Americans, a hyphen. You know, I'm also German, Amer German hyphen American, uh, Anglo hyphen American, but we are all soccer hyphen Americans. We are a nation of soccer people now, and we just have to continue to to expand that. And yeah, we shoot ourselves in the foot. Seems like all the time, but uh, I'm still exceedingly proud of of our country. Uh, and our way of life. And the more soccer grows, it, will, it already represents uh, the colors of our country. Okay? It represents awesome. every nationality Absolutely. that our country represents. It is going to be the face of America, the sport. It, it will happen naturally. Uh, so I think the, the future is going to be very bright. Also, I may add that I think soccer Americans are some of the most patriotic people I know. And why is that? It's because we all are immigrants. And the majority of people that were founding fathers of the game here know what it was like back in their country compared to our country. And they become exceedingly patriotic. And grateful. And, and grateful. And it, it's a strength of our uh, of our soccer American nation. Wow. Whew. Pretty good ending there, I think, right, Ryan? Yeah. John? I always learn something. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we do this, though, right? Like, that's the the hope is that everybody that's listening and watching the show comes out learning something new each time we do one of these shows. And, Hank, I want to thank you for, for taking your time. I know it's a a busy weekend and congratulations again on another hall of fame induction. Um, but thanks very much for sharing your time with us today. Well, really you need to know I would do anything for, uh, my boys, uh, our boys, our team, uh, and, uh, Eric and bones are certainly part of that. And I'd do anything for them. Big time. So all he, all you, any of you have to do is ask and I'll do my best to get it done. John, any conclusions here? I'm not following Hank Steinbrecher. Are you out of your mind? My best, my best to you, uh, Hank, and, and uh, uh, thanks for everything you do. And boys, I'll see you next time. All right, super. Hey, be well. Yes, sir. All right, keep picking. <laughs>